You know how I normally do that thing at the start of an episode where I make it all dramatic and hype up the start of it? Yet, yeah, well, I really don't need to do that today. In my opinion, this is the craziest story that came out of the Reformation. A baker who becomes king and takes on a Catholic army with just 12 of his apostles. A tailor who takes 16 wives at once and then beheads one of them. Cages of dead bodies hung up for all to see that are still around today. I mean, why am I still talking? Let's get into it. Hello there. So like I said, this is perhaps the most insane part of the Reformation, and really I'd love to come back one day and make it a completely animated special, and perhaps even do a podcast length episode on Yarn. However, at 50 subscribers, and on a teacher salary too, I really can't justify hiring an animator, so I'm going to need your help. Click subscribe if you haven't already, like the video, and share it with a friend to help build traction. The more traction we develop, the better I can resource these videos. Anyway, today's video is centered on the city of Munster, which is here in Germany, and is not far away from the border with the Netherlands. And like Luther's Wittenberg, Munster was a city in the Holy Roman Empire. Now, Luther's Wittenberg was controlled by a prince that we looked at called Frederick the Wise, but Munster was governed by a Catholic bishop who ran both the church and the city in Munster, and his name was Bishop von Waldeck. Now, by the time we reached the 1530s, the Anabaptist message had been going strong for about a decade, and about five years had passed since the German peasants revolt. And there was an Anabaptist preacher called Bernard Rothman who toured around Europe preaching a message that the apocalypse was coming and that Jesus was about to come back to judge the wicked. And so one of the cities that Rothman toured was Munster and as he preached in Munster, many Catholics and even Lutherans converted to Anabaptism. Now this was a huge problem for von Waldeck. He'd allowed Lutherans to live in his city because they agreed to live under his rule, but the Anabaptist message was that the apocalypse was coming and that the Catholic government was about to be judged for its evil. He couldn't just execute thousands of his own citizens for heresy because that'd be chaos, but the situation became more and more difficult as thousands of Catholics, particularly women, were getting publicly baptized into the Anabaptist movement. Now, running the church and the city was too much for one bishop to do alone, and so there were elected councils to help govern the city. Now, in February of 1934, after new elections, the council became overwhelmingly Anabaptist, and with the Anabaptists outnumbering the bishop, their message was clear to the Catholics. Convert, flee, or die. Now, von Waldeck was a shrewd operator, and so he fled the city, recruited an army, and then surrounded the city and laid siege to it. He hoped to starve the Anabaptists into surrendering the city back into his hands. But for those who were inside the city of Munster, one question remained. Who was going to rule the city now? And to answer that question, we're going to need to refer to Knowledge Voyage. Hello everyone, this is Knowledge Voyage, and we are very excited to be doing our first collaboration with Mr. Mitchell. At Knowledge Voyage, we cover all periods of history, ranging from the Vikings to the European Age of Conquests, the Reformation and the War on Terror. We also like to do videos on little known periods of history, as well as alternative history, looking at how things may have been very different. So, be sure to subscribe to us. Now, on with the Monster Rebellion. And with Von Waldeck gone, the new leader of Monster was not someone from the nobility, but actually a baker. We're meeting two guys called Jan today. Mr. Mitchell will run you through the second one, but our first Jan was called Jan Matthias. And although he was a baker, he was a very charismatic speaker, and he baptised many people into the Anabaptist movement, constantly claiming that he'd received visions from God. It's also important to remember that Luther was a scholar of the Bible who taught at university level. Matthias was a baker, and so his reading of the Bible was much more at a surface level, but he sure knew how to speak to the common man in Germany. And so, as the new king of Munster, Matthias declared that Munster was a new Jerusalem that would soon become a beacon to the rest of the world. But his reign was to be very short-lived. On Easter Sunday of 1534, he received one of his visions from God. And apparently in this vision, Matthias and his 12 apostles, mirroring the 12 tribes of Israel in the Bible, would go out and fight against von Waldeck's besieging army alone. That's 13 versus a couple of thousand. Needless to say, Matthias' vision wasn't particularly accurate, and he and his 12 apostles were killed. Matthias was completely dismembered, and his head was stuck on a pike for Munster to see. The message was clear. If you don't surrender, this will happen to you. Now here's Mr. Mitchell to talk you through the rest of the rebellion. Thanks Knowledge Voyage. Make sure to subscribe to his channel. There's loads of great content on the Reformation, and for many other parts of history too. And so after Jan Matthias died, a new person, also called Jan, stepped up to the plate and called himself the king. This time it was a tailor called Jan of Leiden. And so Jan of Leiden's first move was to marry Jan Matthias' widow, he basically said marry me or die, and Jan announced that every woman of marrying age had to be married to someone. Now, this was a bit of an issue for Munster. The ratio of women to men was 3 to 1. So really, only one third of the women could be married. So, how do you solve such a problem? Well, Jan of Leiden gave the green light to polygamy and a race ensured between the men of Munster to rack up as many wives as possible. 
According to Catholics who would later reclaim the city, Jan took 16 wives. Now, Jan justified this by saying that the biblical view of sex was that it was for procreation and within the context of marriage, so having more wives equals more procreation happening. Now, what else happened in the city of Munster is pretty tough to know because the city itself was sacked by the Catholics when they invaded, and our only sources are these heavily biased Catholic sources, but we do know a few things. While Munster starved under siege, Jan dined like a king and lived a very lavish lifestyle. One of his wives tried to encourage Jan to distribute some of his wealth out to the people, to which he responded very reasonably, and he beheaded her. And when von Voldek tried to launch his first invasion of the city, Jan ordered the townsmen to wait on the top of the hill and pour boiling water on the climbing soldiers and stab them with spears. Anyone from Munster who dared suggest to surrender to von Voldek was killed. And so even when starving, Jan refused to surrender Munster over and von Voldek remained unsuccessful in launching an invasion. The siege would have to play on. Now, thankfully for von Boldeck, he had an inside source, Heinrich Gresbeck. And so Gresbeck snuck the bishop's forces into Munster, and then they pummeled the unsuspecting Anabaptists. Now, Jan was found hiding in a dungeon, and von Boldeck's army took him, ripped him to pieces using hot iron tongs, they ripped his tongue out before placing a burning dagger into him, and then his corpse was placed up in a cage at the top of Munster's cathedral for everyone to see. Now, the bones actually stayed in there for about 50 years, and you can still see the cage in Munster today. And so von Boldeck was clear. No such Anabaptist rebellion is to ever happen again. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe if you haven't already, and don't forget to hit that like button. Make sure to subscribe to Knowledge Voyage, who was really helpful in today's episode, and I'll see you next time for our next venture into a fascinating part of history.